I'm very happy to be in a conversation with Anupama Raju, whose work I've followed for a long time. And we meet, uh, as always, on poetry, on poetry stages where we are both, you know, reading poems. Uh, but it's nice to sit down and uh, have a conversation. So uh, we don't have a moderator, so we're going to be asking each other questions. Um, so one of the things is that this is... Um, as a starting point to the conversation, this is C. This is a no, uh, the latest novel by Anupama Raju. And it's a book of both poetry and exceptional prose. And uh, to start today's conversation, which is about poetry and prose, I want to ask Anupama, how does she um, see this intersection of prose and poetry in her work, but also um, um, whenever I speak with other friends who are also poets who are writing prose, um, they always tell me that it's quite a struggle to write. Uh, I think Tishani Doshi at one point told me, you know, a normal prose writer can just go, he went and opened the door, but when you're a poet, you just don't bring yourself to say, I got up and opened the door. <laughs> it seems very banal. So how do you, how do, you do this transition? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, Meena, that's a very relevant question for those of us who uh, write in both, uh, you know, prose and poetry. And this is my first novel. So, even though I've uh, published poetry before, uh, my poetry book is available. Um, you're absolutely right. I think for a, a poet to write in prose, especially for a poet who's who's atten attempting or writing a novel. Uh, there is no map, only a maze, if you ask me. Uh, I think those who are natural prose writers, they probably have a map, you know. Uh, they are able to think it out. They have a plot, they have an outline, they know how to go about it. I'm, I mean, I'm not saying they don't have their struggles, I'm sure they do. But in my case, uh, uh, it took me about five years to write this book. and. Uh, and um, there was absolutely no, uh, in the beginning there was no map, uh, it, was, it was just uh, a maze, I would just keep going round and round in circles and it's not possible to write a, a straightforward sentence um, or uh, describe an event as it happened logically, uh, you know, in, in that uh, particular time sequence or any such thing. So we're always we're constantly thinking in terms of, I think, capturing the essence like how we would do in a poem. And we try to narrow it down. We're looking at it in that sense and not, there's no universe. I think there's a, there's a spot which slowly grows into a planet. <laughs> what about you? Uh, what has your experience been? Because uh, Meena too, as you all know, uh, you know, uh, started out as a poet and then she's brought out um, three brilliant novels, uh, two, three, right? Yeah, and then of course now her latest uh, work, uh, which I'm dying to read, uh, her translations of Thiruvalluvar. Um, so what about you? How would you describe the process? Uh, it's... Um it's a, it's a little bit like how you described, you know, the struggle to get sentences, but also um, I think the main thing that a fiction writer has uh, or needs to cultivate as opposed to poet is stamina. Mm. Like this is a long haul work that you're not going to, it's, it's not going to give you the satisfaction that poetry gives to you, both in terms of writing, because poetry is much more quicker to, you know, write, even if you spend years with a poem, it doesn't take away as much from you as a long form novel does. You spend literally like four or five years with a novel, so um, it's very much like investing in a relationship. It's like, oh, do you, do you want to look at it every day? Um, are you going to get bored of this book? Are you going to be happy to come back to this each and every day? So I think um, this is a question you don't think for poetry, you know, like there's something that you, moves you deeply enough, you write, and then you go on to the next thing. So uh, one of the first things I learned was, you know, stamina, but also learning to to keep myself in one place, you know, like seated or, you know. 
So uh, that's the first thing that I learned in terms of the energy that it takes from you. The second thing is also um, in terms of reception, because when you do poetry, it's so intimate. I often find that like teaching, like you can come on a stage and you can read, and the response is so, uh, so immediate and so intimate, and it's like you're just sharing in the moment. But fiction or you know lo novels, they don't take the, they, it's not the same. Like even if you're reading a brilliant passage, nobody connects to you, you easily. They have to find the characters, they have to fall in love with them or hate them or feel one way or the other about it. So obviously the feedback loop is different. The kind of energy that's required of you is different. Mm. At the same time, um, I have increasingly felt the need to bo do both essays and fiction because of the political climate, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, because on the one hand, of course, you write poetry to events, uh, but you also have to, um, you know, make meaning of what is there. So, you know, you do journalist st journalistic stuff, you, you do uh, long form nonfiction, uh, and you also have to, I also think that one of the things about poetry and prose and other things, um, just because, you know, just came to me, um, is that today we are not even in a position where we can only talk about poetry and prose. Like um, sometimes I think you know we can have a book every five years. It's great to make that kind of statement, to make that kind of political statement, that artistic statement. But the you know the larger atmosphere of fascism means that you should also learn learn how to respond immediately. You should learn how to uh, how to put yourself out there in the moment so you and for that you borrow from both poetry and prose from prose you learn how to uh, you know put the important points together or the intellectual arguments together from poetry you learn how to be brief mm -hmm. and i think um, just existing in the public domain uh, in some ways sharpens both your poetry and your prose skills yeah yeah and i think the other thing which uh, struck me is also when we are writing poetry uh, the whole process is a lot more uh, internalized and mm -hmm. uh, you did use the word intimate earlier. So uh, we are kind of talking to an inner voice within us and it probably talks to individuals at an individual level. While uh, prose or when we are writing fiction, it gives us an opportunity to step out of ourselves because we are also creating characters, we have to think on their behalf and uh, we I think have to become less self-centered and we are no longer just kind of uh, talking about something that we are preoccupied with but we are giving life to other people so we have to distance ourselves uh, from us. Uh, I think that is one of the advantages of that, of that form. Uh, that is something um, I think. Also prose I think um, helps us to think a little more uh, logically and uh, maybe it's a form that belongs to the mind while poetry belongs to the heart. I don't know. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I was, you know, recently someone asked me, oh, what do you, what do you say, wish someone said to you when you were a younger person who just started writing? Um, and uh, I was trying to think through like what advice would have benefited me like you know 20 years ago and uh, one of the things that I actually felt I wish somebody had told me was that all of writing I think nine tenths of writing 90 percent of writing is thinking mm. like if you get the thinking straight if you get your thoughts in order if you get your arguments in order even for poetry like if you get the punchline in order if you get the flow in order then the writing itself is like so much more easier to carry out once you do the the all of the ch thinking and of course you know even if it's emotional feeling all of that is where I think the real action does. I wanted to ask you something about uh, your book um, which I relished reading, uh, which actually intermarries these two concepts in a very different way because you know you say poetry is from the heart and prose is from this, but in your book there's this uh, this woman at the heart of it. And she's a poet in love. She's also a woman in love. And the way in which her feelings are explored in a very granular level, like how does she feel when someone writes to her? How does she feel when someone is silent? Like every little thing. And uh, for me, I just want to ask you, one is that this novel is very, uh, it's very literary, but how do you place yourself uh, as a poet novelist, but also, <laughs> as a poet who is writing and also as a novelist 
writing into Indian English, right, Indian English literature. How do you look at this work? And what do you especially think about female desire? Because to find a language for female desire, I think, is a constant battle, isn't it? Yes, yeah, totally. So, yeah. I think desire, um, not I think, I know, that desire is something that is explored in detail in the book. The, there are lots of passages which uh, explicitly describe the <laughs> protagonist's desire for this man. And uh, she's talking about how she's craving him. She also talks about how it makes her hungry, it makes her weak. Uh, it kind of eats into her peace of mind. In fact, there's a line which says, I was, in pe I was at peace before I met you, I w I'm in pieces after I met you. So, uh, it, there is, that is what desire has done to her. At the same time, I think we definitely need more uh, writing and not necessarily couched in any way, but explicit, uh, explicitly put about female desire. Um, and as far as um, this book is concerned, how do I place it? Uh, I, first and foremost, I think I consider myself essentially a poet novelist. I don't think I will ever be able to move away from poetry. I started writing poetry, that is how I started expressing myself. So even when I wrote my first novel, poetry was definitely uh, a technique uh, to tell the story. Um, and in fact, uh, many people who've read it have told me that this is a poet's novel. The prose is very poetic, you know, it's not the regular prose. Um, and uh, it's very lyrical. These are all words that they have used. So uh, it's not a conscious thing, but perhaps the uh, attention we would pay to... Uh, when, when we write a poem, we pay attention to metaphors and imagery, right? We don't want to sound hackneyed, we don't want to sound ordinary, we labor a bit at it. Perhaps the same kind of labor went into writing this book as well. I would like um, readers um, to look at this book as, a, um, as an intimate uh, poetic novel that tells the story of a woman um, who is trying to discover herself uh, as she uh, loves and loses. Do you want to read, uh, do you, would you read something, Anupama? Yeah, sure. I would read and then, of course, we should listen to you as well. And I also have a couple of questions I have to ask you. So all our books are uh, available in the bookshop and we are happy to sign them for you. Okay, so I'm going to start, I'm going to read from the beginning of the novel a few pages. So the, um, the, a lot of the narration is done by this place called C. The book is called C, as in the letter C. And um, so C is one of the narrators of the story. C is a place, is the name of a place. It's an imagined place. What's unique about C is that there is no sun here. So it's in perpetual dark. And uh, this is where the protagonist goes to spend some time away from her country uh, to work on something and to write, basically. And uh, she is in C and she's constantly thinking of this person who we never get to meet. Um, and uh, this, her lover, who is an absentia lover. So that's how that goes. So I'm going to start with... Uh, with the opening pages. I am C. They write about places the way they write about themselves. They think they know them, yet they are only discovering them. They travel where memories take them, where desires build them homes, and then they call them cities. I am not like those places. I don't resemble those cities. I have survived centuries without light. I have embraced darkness like a woman accepts life with grace. 
My people have built their lives around perpetual night. I survive. I promise neither memory nor desire, yet travelers seek refuge in me. I invite neither pilgrims nor prophets, yet they throng my doors seeking wisdom and solace. I welcome neither lovers nor dreamers, but they come to my gardens to fall in love. I am C. This is a story that could be mine and my storytellers. City Without Day On this cold afternoon, see the city without daylight shines like black satin under a benevolent moon. It is murky, but the trees on either side of the road seem to rejoice in their shadows. The branches quiver like wrinkled, bony fingers. Unaccustomed to what winter does to trees in this part of the world, I think of home, my sea, where the trees are a lush green all year round. Every now and then there is evidence of life. Two residents of sea walk with their dogs while another rides a bicycle. There are wood pigeons cooing incessantly. They sound very different from the pigeons back home. Melancholic and mournful, their cries punctuate the air. Curious about life without daylight, I wonder what night would be like. When it was time to choose which city I'd go for my writing sabbatical, I didn't have to think twice. Cimmerian as crow feathers, stark and sunless, sea stood there, a beckoning crescent moon with its shadowing secrets and allure. A city dark and dusky as the bark of a neem tree. A city where day is as promising as night, with all its mystical blackness, this is where I will work on my book. I had waited far too long for this, and now I am here. I walk, suitcases rattling behind me, with the smells of economy class travel. I am eager to fan, find my flat on the university campus, the flat that will be my universe for the next few months. I reach the apartment building and confirm the address. 60C, Picklewood. I remember the first time I saw the address in an email from the building manager. In an otherwise matter-of-fact note, this was one thing that made the place instantly inviting. My mouth waters when I think about the Picklewood I would inhabit, and my tongue conjures up the salty sourness of mango, lime, and gooseberries. Picklewood, pecan warm and spicy. Inside the building, a picture of T.S. Eliot hangs like a lazy spider web overlooking the stairway. If you aren't in over your head, how do you know how tall you are? Says a plaque next to it. For the next several months, I would pass by these words every day, sometimes in awe of the genius, sometimes in hurt. If you aren't in over your head, how do you know how tall you are? How easy for him to have said it. I've always had a taste for being in over my head. I had outgrown myself already, so his challenge seems kind of pointless. Still, I accept it. Little do I know that those words would surround me like ants for years on end. A pigeon cry startles me out of my thoughts, and I carry my suitcases up the stairs. On the second floor, the corridor is a narrow, windowless capsule that responds to my footsteps. With each step, a light comes on, waking up the walls, the floor, and the flies. I'm happy there are flies. Usually, they are condemned to spend their lives in less fortunate climes. 
but here they are, large and present as life itself. I open the door to my flat. My fingers stumble across the wall, searching for the switches, when I realize the light is indifferent to my footsteps. The room is a far cry from the warmth of pickle wood. It is sterile and white like a hospital ward. A single large lamp lights up the apartment, filling it with white light. It is a cyclops and my eyes feel powerless and small in its presence. It will, for the next few, for the next many nights, be witness to so many words. In a few minutes, everything seems adequate and suddenly spacious. I like my room. What kindles this unexpected burst of affection is a large glass window. It offers a view of little cottages, the road and the woods in the far distance. Again, I see the quivering treetops. This time they seem closer. It's close to 6 p.m. now. There's no sunset in sea, I remember. How would it be to breathe, eat and sleep in the sunless air? How does it feel to have no sun? They say the sun makes you happier and your spirit lighter. In its absence, how much harder would the moon have to work to nourish life here? I remember his words, like I remember everything about him. Go out in the sun as much as possible, it is good for you. He was light and bright as the sun, with a smile that was arrogant yet generous. A smile he lent readily to anybody he met, a kind of perpetual resplendence that never tired him. I remember how he wants me to be happy. Whatever he told me made sense. It was to make me healthier and calm my mind. He was the father I wished I had had, the lover he is, the husband he could have been, the father of my unborn children. We were partners, friends, hopelessly in love, bound by our fate, trapped in other commitments. But in this solitude, I was free to spend unfettered time with him if he were to join me in sea. He was patient as a tree, unshaken by my tumultuous spirit, protecting the wilderness of my mind which swung to extremes. So his prescription that I go out in the sun made sense. I'm just going to skip to a poem with which this chapter ends. Spring Song The corridor howls, the wind sings a different tune. I have no time, I have no time. Doors open and close, chatter spills, tonight I will need my pills. I have no time, I have no time. Outside, a girl in shorts just walked into her house. Isn't it freezing? What will she do to warm her thighs? Ah, the joys of peering, leering. There must be couples in these boxed houses, promising each other pain, living in disdain. Over dinner, they argue about electricity bills. Whose turn was it to pay this month, his or hers? Yet an hour later, the sex isn't too bad for him or her. I have no time, I have no time. Yes, tonight I will need my pills, but not before I take a shower. A tremulous voice slips in along with me. I can't see him, and so I don't mind. His verse lulls me into melancholy. My mind is naked as my body, seeks other such voices, but I hear only my own. I have no time, I have no time. I will need my will tonight. I will need my pills to drown. I will need my pills. Thank you. Nina, please. What would you like to read from? Okay, sure, okay. Do you want to talk about what was the um, impetus for your first novel, The Gypsy Goddess? Uh, yeah, uh, so I just th I thought that, yeah, we could give a little bit of a break between the readings because... Okay, uh, yeah. Um, okay. I didn't want them to sound uh, like we just went from sea to another place. <laughs> sure. So, uh, so the thing is, um, and this is a question we both were also discussing earlier, 
which was uh, how do we find what is it about prose that draws us still, yeah. you know even if we are poets and so your question is quite uh, right up there like why would i do a novel uh, because i still think that as much as i find poetry very powerful and you know it delivers on what it has to um, you it, you cannot always use poetry in the same way to let's say tell a larger story um, or use poetry as a kind of remembrance. So, you know, I had to write about a massacre that takes place in 1968, and uh, 44 um, untouchable or Dalit laborers are burned to death because they are fighting for higher wages. So it's a very communist struggle. It's a very village, rural struggle. It's an agrarian strike. And how much of it can, um, you know, what happens in Kilwimni, how much can poetry contain? So, and especially because, uh, you know, there's something about poetry that's so direct, mm. but there's something about politics and uh, that's so subversive, but also like uh, everybody's at cross purposes with each other. Everybody's using language for their own benefit. Um, and to bring out all of this tension, to bring out, to bring out the fullness of character. So it was just like, you know, th this is in, in so some ways it could have been an epic but in some ways it also had to to go into the unruliness of prose to to kind of capture especially for me i wanted to capture the register of voices you know uh, how does a police report talk about people like how does it dehumanize them mm -hmm. because 44 people die but in the post mortem reports you don't see anything about the people you just see they're numbered as objects so somebody is, you know, exhibit A, this person is burnt beyond recognition, somebody is exhibit B. So when you, when you just use it as it is, when you use police records as it is to tell your story, you're trying to show what the system does. You want to show how the system dehumanizes people. It takes away their character. You want to show how um, all of the range of language. So for instance, there's one chapter in which I had to fashion it like a Communist Party pamphlet. And we know very well, like especially in Kerala, where where the where the Communist Party is like in power, you realize how they deploy language. It's a very different way from the way language is deployed. Otherwise, you know, so there's a very politically coded way of speaking, and you know, there's the way in which revolution is made like inevitable, but also all powerful, all encompassing. And so for me, language was, um, prose was one way in which it captured all of these aspects of language without just me finding my voice. It also allowed me to, um, you know, show other people's voices, I think. So uh, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, the act of writing uh, poetry or the act of writing prose, do you think, um, because some people say, you know, uh, from poetry, if you've kind of made a transition to prose, then it's difficult to come back to poetry. Is it true? And, uh, no, I don't know. I think um, poets are somewhat superstitious people, if <laughs> I may say so myself. So sometimes, you know, there's a person in your life or you're in love and then all the poems keep coming and then suddenly you're like, no... Uh, like I know a couple of writers, I think Anjum Hassan, for instance, at some point she stopped writing poetry and she was telling, my well of poetry has dried up. Mm. Um, and for me, I, I was, uh, you know, I had my last collection out in 2010 and it's 12 years or 13 years later, my next collection is coming out this summer. So I was like, this is really a huge gap between books because poets are supposed to be like extremely prolific, isn't it? You, you produce a book a year and I'm like, you know, uh, and the only reason this book came about is because I was stuck for two years in the pandemic with two small children. So I, I just couldn't do prose. I, I was looking at what I had written through these years and trying to salvage, like, okay. Um, and I found that uh, it was not me going back to poetry. It was much more like uh, a kind of reaction to the times because, uh, you know, it's... I realized that over the last seven years, especially when India has been under, uh, you know, somewhat oppressive political circumstances, that you respond a lot more through poetry. Like, mm. you know, suddenly, even if you like to do fiction, even if you like to do prose, or you write, like to write op-eds, there's a certain space for poetry that nothing else can take. And then um, it's not just the space of the poetry itself, it's also the space of the poet as a stand-in. 
the space of the poet is somebody who can say something that ends up being powerful. So what is your political role there? So I think that um, in some ways I had to go back and uh, rest that space for myself and say, you know, I'm here as a poet, I'm here to speak to you as a poet. So for me, going back felt natural. Uh, it still feels natural. Um, but I also think that, you know, when you're a poet, you're like literally marked for life. Like even if I write novels and, you know, in the UK, for instance, I only publish novels. But in India, I will always be this poet. Mm. <laughs> because that's, a, you know what I mean? Like once you start with poetry, it's, um, it's both a curse and something. You just can't move out of it. You just, you're just labeled a poet. So I think that is the... Uh, it's not a bad label, I think. It's not <laughs> a bad label, no. We can look at it. Um, so I just had one question for you sure. on translations, maybe before we yeah. ask questions or I read something and then open the floor. Uh, so what do you think? Of, you do a lot of translations. I wanted to know how does it affect your poetry? Uh, well, so far I, I find it has uh, uh, not affected my poetry. In fact, I think it's a healthy influence. Uh, in, in translations, we are always aware. I mean, you translate too, and you offlate, uh, you just translated this, uh, the Tirukural. Um, we are stepping out of ourselves, and we are suddenly entering the landscape of another poet or another writer. So we are constantly aware of the fact that we need to do justice to what this individual has written. and. That is a responsibility, a moral responsibility. So you are c constantly questioning the choice of your words and uh, you know the, the idiom or any such thing, any phrase, uh, the cultural implications, the context. Um, so that hasn't, uh, I've been working essentially with Paul Zakria and his uh, short fiction. Um, but I've also translated Anita Tampi's uh, poetry into uh, English. So uh, I'm very aware that it's, this is not mine. And so I just want to ensure that their voice gets represented with complete justice. Um, so that just takes me further away from myself. So I'm, I'm very happy to, you know, step away uh, so I, uh, this this variety of writing tasks or assignments. So uh, I'm writing poetry at one point, and then I'm writing maybe a column for a newspaper where you know it's an entirely different uh, uh, thing altogether. And then you're translating, where again you're doing something else. And then maybe you're trying your hand at a new novel, where again you're coming back to the uh, you know the the entire structure of prose. I think each of these uh, activities or each of these uh, genres uh, trains us in many ways, in ways that we are even we are not aware of. So poetry teaches us to uh, be succinct and uh, capture something in the most meaningful and in the most uh, maybe you know uh, through a nucleus. But uh, prose gives us a little more of an expansive uh, environment, while translation teaches you to think through two languages, uh, at the same time doing justice to your target audience uh, and the writer you're translating. So um, it's, it's great fun and a lot of training, and uh, it really teaches you to be patient. What has your experience been translating Thiruvallur? Uh, um. Yeah, this is quite interesting because uh, when I start translating, um, most writers I have translated, um, it's always this attraction to what they stand for politically or what they mean in society. So if it's Periyar or Tiruma or somebody like, you know, they stand for anti-caste politics, they stand for feminist politics. So even before I read their work fully, I'm like, I'm going to translate this. And mm -hmm. then my first act of reading is my first act of translation. So I read and then I start translating immediately. So I have been, um, and I haven't done in that sense uh, the same number of literary translations because I have been largely a political translator, uh, which I say without any feeling of um, uh, regret or shyness because it's so important to to kind of agitate the political landscape in this country where everything is, uh, you know, either run by English-speaking people or people in Delhi and, you know, they don't realize that 
you know, there's very rich political cultures in the South. Uh, there's very rich political history or feminist history in this place. So sometimes it becomes very imperative to do these translations because you're like telling, this is my history and we want you to, we want to place that front and center of who we are and what's our identity. Uh, with Tiruvalluvar, so, um, and then the only time I did fiction translation was with Salma's work. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that there's a, you touched on it, like you really want to keep it at an arm's distance, isn't it? And uh, I think it's, it's an issue when, not an issue, but it's something that happens when the writers are all alive because yeah. you don't want to be, um, it's a kind of anxiety of influence. You don't want to anybody to assume that you are Salma in English, you know. <laughs> uh, you are you have your own style, and especially Correct. for somebody who does their own work, like you know, you do your own literature. So you, mm. there's this. Whole, but then um, I came into translation in some way after I had published two or three novels and lots of poems. So I could say, there's no way somebody is thinking this is my work, which doesn't mean that the work I'm doing is not lovely. Like the mm. translation is great as well. But it's just not my style. And um, in that sense, I would like to choose somebody who doesn't do something that overlaps with my style or my way of looking at the world. Because then you become, you synthesize into one person. And this synthesis is good if it's just political writing, because a lot of political writing is, you know, you overlapping into someone, someone overlapping. Like all of you are like, especially if you're like a Marxist or a feminist, you're all overlapping into each other. Like, you know, just saying the same thing, but more powerfully, more vehemently with a different kind of uh, filter. Uh, I think that uh, with Tiruvalluvar it was really different uh, because for one he's been like dead for 2,000 years. <laughs> yes. And the second thing is that, um, you know, I could, I could keep the text at an arm's distance because, you know, it's easy to say, okay, I'm not influenced by Tiruvalluvar. But strangely, this was a poet I was reading when I was 13 or 14. Mm. Um, and uh, the second thing is also, this was the first feminist translation. So in 2000 years, this classic did not have a female translator. So this was like for me, and also for me, it was more intimate than any of the poems I myself had written, you know, like, um, uh, I don't know what example to say, like, there's so many of these that, um, you know, somewhere she says, um, um, in, 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 I, I paraphrase it in English, so she says about uh, the man who told me um, not to be afraid, he has left me. So how does all your public scandal, how is it even going to affect me? And this is somebody writing 2000 years ago, but then it feels so personal, it feels so immediate. And then you're like, you know, this sounds like your life mm. that he's writing about. Or, or like, you know, you talk about this guy who comes and, you know, like this, she has no peace. And there's actually a Kural that says, um, he comes, no sleep, he goes, no sleep. Mm -hmm. um, this is the fate of my eyes that weep. And, uh, and this, these are like, you know, of course, it's very old. It's ancient classic poetry. But at the same time, it, when you translate it, it feels like it's yours. You feel like, yeah, yeah it feels like... It's your experience, and uh, also I think this this gap, the fact that there has not been women using this to talk about themselves, because sometimes that's what you can do with a classic text. You make it your own in such a way that you are talking about your desire. It's not about Valluvar's desire. You, you're owning this text. And for me, the, the issue here was also, you know, Valluvar says at some point, uh, so in Tamil it actually, English means, um, I never knew anything called death. So this is like a warrior who is a lover. He says, I never knew what was death. And then now I know, you know, by looking at this woman's eyes. Uh, and then I'm like, okay. So for me the whole idea is that, you know, women exist inside the book. They exist as lovers. They exist as these fear, uh, fiery creatures. But why don't they exist as, exist as translators? Um, so the woman in love in this book is a Tamil woman, but she can, can she exist paratextually? Can she exist as the woman who talks about this love? The mm. woman who says, I am the woman in this book, mm. who says this is how desire is expressed. And then I felt that, you know, I never felt for a second I was write, doing somebody else's work. In some way, Valluvar became like I was writing my own poems, but remaining true to what he said. So I think it's really at some point that you just become that person because of how wonderful the text is. So 
so yeah, I really, really enjoyed myself doing that. I also think what was very interesting for me was uh, going back to Valluvar's text, you know, the Tirukkural, which is 2,000 years old, and realizing that, you know, the Tamil, uh, even Tamil people are in love, we are always having these false quarrels or small little quarrels. Oodle. Oodle, yes. <laughs> and to realize that Oodle is so part of, like, um, uh, Valluvar says, Oodle, Unardal, Punardal, Ivai Kamam Kudi are Petrapayan. So, what he means there is that quarrel, reconcile, make love. These are the lover's rewards. And it talks so much about why you are having all of these little fights with each other, you know, like. And this is something you, I could never explain to somebody else, the need for these little fights, you know, like kind of like a salt in your relationship. And then you realize that, you know, okay, so some of this does come from culture. So, yeah, it was beautiful. Uh, so, I'm going to open this to the audience. Or maybe. Why don't you read? Uh, we would love to listen to you read. Oh, yeah, sure. So, maybe from one of your novels or the last novel? The novel, yeah. yeah. Uh, this was quite, I'm going to read a very short, uh, like two pages from the novel. And this was a very strange experience because um, I was trying to keep like a diary of what's happening in my life and trying to see how I was projecting what was happening in my life on the world of my fiction, like what gets borrowed and what gets created. And uh, s strangely, I was teaching, but also uh, uh, I finished writing this book uh, five days before my son was born. So I was heavily pregnant, having already one child. And uh, I remember that when I was writing, it's a very slim book, it's called Exquisite Cadavers. Uh, that I was composing a lot of the sentences in my head, like you would compose a poem, so so that you know I'm with the I'm with one child or I'm taking care of myself. So we're just writing this like like from memory and then transcribing it. So I think there's a, a certain poetry quality to it. Nothing hides mutual disdain as well as a marriage. Nothing hides a marriage in shambles as well as a spruced up orderly home. Stacked ceramic coffee mugs do not sneak up and tell the stories of unclasped hands. Clean linen sheets in their fail-safe lavender and citrus geometry are crisply deceptive. What can window sills betray? Not the tight top knot of a sad woman who rests her elbows on them and counts the slow passing of the hours. Who can catalog the things that are eating her? The disquieting silence from a dear one, the impending arrival of a child, the struggle to make up the monthly rent on time, memories of dead friends, a mother whose face she cannot bring herself to remember. Who can prize and persuade walls to reveal what they have witnessed? Holding no permanent memories, they are ill-equipped to paint out the pictures of parting shadows. Ashtrays are tight-lipped traitors. They remain smug, clumsily carrying the charred remains of late afternoons with the indifference of embedded journalists. The white board in the kitchen is hung over Hemingway, adjective-free, pruned and purposeful, displaying the timing of Spanish lessons, errands for an elderly parent, grocery shopping, mm -hmm. bills to be paid. They hide botched suicide attempts, emotional breakdowns. The closets and medicine cabinets remain shut. Order creates the semblance of domestic peace. With such lingering, sultry peace, arguments appears out of place. The space imposes conformity, demands signing up to obedience. To break the silence, it becomes imperative to break the pretense of peace. Plates, hand-painted hand balls, fancy wine glasses, empty beer bottles need to be knocked out of the inertia, shaken up, smashed. Fragility as a force field does not allow itself to be perturbed. The clattering waits in the wings, romps around within four walls, impatient to join the checkerboard of grey cityscapes, wills itself to collapse into familiar rhythm. So I'm going to stop here.